Can you hear me fine? Yes, sounds like it. Okay. Uh, well, it's been a long day for you guys. It's been a long day for me. <laughs> uh, flying very early this morning from, from Paris, but it, it's good to be here. I hope you have some energy left. It's a, it's a longer session, uh, and so we will have plenty of time. And uh, I suggest if you have any questions during the session, please ask your questions. Please raise your hand, and we have a microphone somewhere. Uh, that you can grab and ask your question, okay? I, I'd rather have a more interactive session than just wait until the end and answer questions on stuff I was talking about 34 minutes ago, okay? So please raise your hand and ask all your questions. So my name is uh, Julien or Julian or Giuliano or whatever you want to, <laughs> to use, that's fine. I'm a tech evangelist uh, for AWS. I'm based in the Paris office. Some, sometimes, because most of the time I'm really traveling and, um, and talking to uh, developers and, and uh, like today, and that's, that's fine. Uh, I've been with AWS for about a year and a half, uh, and before that uh, I was, uh, I, I've spent the last 10 years or so as a CTO and VP engineering in uh, web startups in Paris, okay? So indeed, today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and um, I'm going to take you on that uh, long journey that started in, in the 50s. And if everything goes well, uh, we'll end up running some stuff on my uh, Raspberry Pi robot, which is uh, waiting in the shadow uh, to exterminate us all, maybe, who knows. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see what we can do with this, OK? So uh, I'll start with um, a, a very quick introduction of AI and, uh, and why it's been mostly frustrating so far. And then we're going to talk about uh, Amazon AI. Uh, wha what do we do at Amazon and AWS? And recently, fairly recently, we've had some, some new stuff coming out. And then I'm going to talk about, and the, the, the most of the presentation actually will focus on um, an, a, an Apache project called MXNet. Um, who has already heard of MXNet? All right, well, OK. I I'm progressing. Usually, it's zero people which is why I'm talking about it. Uh, so MXNet is, uh, is a deep learning library, uh, which is extremely developer friendly. It's really designed for quick experimentation by developers and uh, by non-experts, right? So I always say you don't have to have a, a PhD to use MXNet, and that's fine. That's exactly what we want to do. Uh, so we'll talk about MXNet for a minute you know, the high-level features and so on. And then, of course, we'll go into some demos uh, using Python code. Code, What a surprise, right? I can show you some other code if you want, but you're going to throw stuff at me, right? So it has to be Python today. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, I'll point you to some more tools and some more resources to get you started. So the story so far, well, that's it, right? So who has no idea what this is? It's okay if you raise your hand. All right. Okay. So you make. Thank you for make me making me feel very old. Um, yeah. I keep thinking some people in the room are older and, than me, but as time goes by, this becomes false. Uh, you know, all the time. So this obviously is from the Stanley Kubrick movie, 2001: A Space Odyssey. If you haven't seen it, you have to see this. It's it's a masterpiece, and it's the first visual representation of artificial intelligence. It came out in 1968 or 1969, and this computer uh, is inside a spaceship, and it's really running the ship, and the astronauts, you, you, you even wonder why you have astronauts in there, which is probably why the computer decides to kill them eventually. Um, well, so you know the end, but you should still see the movie. Um, and I guess a lot of geeks like me and computer scientists and researchers have been obsessed with, with this uh, you know, when, when we first saw the movie. This is what we're trying to build, right? This is the ultimate artificial intelligence that can understand natural language, that can speak, uh, that can handle very different and very complex tasks. You know, imagine driving a spaceship, you know, how complicated is that? So, this is basically what people have been trying to conceive and, and build over the years. And, well, have they succeeded? No. And actually, in 2001, the real year 2001, 
um, a famous computer scientist called Marvin Minsky. Uh, he's the, one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. He founded the, uh, the AI uh, lab at the MIT and did plenty of other things. And actually, he was an advisor to Kubrick on the movie, right? So he worked with Kubrick in 68 to design what HAL would look like, right? So pretty funny. And so in 2001, M Minsky wrote a paper said, it's 2001, where is HAL? Uh, and well, obviously nowhere. And it, it, it gave a number of reasons why artificial intelligence had not made a lot of progress in 40 or 50 years, right? And he thought we were very, still very, very far away from having HAL. And I think it's a paradox because it, it, in the mid 2000s, uh, machine learning started to explode, right? And now today, everybody, uh, who's doing machine learning in the room? See, all right, okay, thank you. <laughs> everybody, right? All right, at least everybody has machine learning on their resume and that's very nice, right? I have it. Uh, so. Um, it's a commodity. It's easy to do machine learning. Uh, you can do. Uh, you can get some open source libraries. You can grab in. You know the Scikit uh, tools in Python and build um, machine learning models in just a few lines of code. You can use cloud-based services. You can use. You know. You have a wide choice. So, you know, why did machine learning become so successful, f starting in you know 2000 uh, until you know 2010 and now even more so. Why did this make a lot of progress, and why did AI not make a lot of progress in the same years, right? Well, it's because, as you know, in machine learning, it's all about the features, right? So you, it's fairly easy to build a prediction model, provided that you have clear features. And actually, most of the work of data science is to find what features are useful in the data set. Um, how to engineer them, how to prepare them so that they can deliver a nice, efficient working model. Okay, so let's take an example. If you have a web log, uh, Apache log or something similar, and you want to use those logs to predict user activity, you know, it could be uh, predict uh, what uh, link they're going to click on, what ad they're going to click on, et cetera, et cetera, typical activities, then all the features are pretty much available, right? You just look at what the log has and, you know, the time and date and, uh, and URL and user agent and, and uh, blah, 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 and probably 50 more. And you just have to figure out which ones, a user ID, obviously, and you have to figure out which ones are the ones that are the most relevant for your machine learning model, okay? And you go and tweak them and combine them and twist them into form until you have a working model. Now, let's take a different problem, okay? Suppose I take a picture of this room, you know, a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels, and I wanna know who's in the room, or what's in the room, or is that even a room? <laughs> I wanna know what the picture is. Okay, so it's a million pixels. And if it's a color picture, it's likely that it's actually three million pixels, right? Red, green, and blue. So, does this mean I have three million features? Should I? take those three million features, you know, f flatten them and, and, and send them into a, a prediction model? Would that work? <laughs> Probably not, right? I'm sure some, some people have tried, but you know, that's not really working. And if you think about it, does it even make sense, right? Is every single pixel in this picture uh, a, a useful information, right? Look at your, the, the, the seat you're sitting on. I mean, it's all gray and it's all the same color. So do I need all those individual pixels to figure out this is a seat and it's gray? Again, probably not, right? Common sense tells me no, I don't, okay. But that's the difficulty in, in building those smart applications, right? Common sense, human common sense, tells us the answer immediately. If we brought a five-year-old kid, a five-year-old kid in this room and, and asked, okay, what do you see? He said, well, I uh, see people sitting in a room. So it looks like a classroom maybe, right? And if you show animal pictures to that kid and say, okay, is that, is that a cat, is that a tiger, is this a dog? He would know instantly, okay? But if you ask that kid, okay, 
how do you know it's a how do you know it's a lion and how do you know this is a cat right then it becomes more complicated okay and it would give you some answers right but how do you fit that into data that a computer can understand and that's the number one problem with deep learning right and this is the problem that deep learning is actually trying to solve it's trying to solve uh, it's trying to teach computers to understand informal things right things that you and me know pretty much you know from four year olds uh, from being four year olds and, and, and older but it's impossible to teach a computer to do this okay so machine if you try to do it the machine learning way it doesn't work okay because there are too many features there's just too much information and you cannot feed all this information to a machine learning model and get a decent result so of course the answers to this is neural networks and they're not new at all they've been around for uh, decades the early work even goes back to the late 40s but the the, the the first major um, applications came in the 50s, right? So it's literally 60 years old technology, right? 60 years old. And what is the neural network, actually? Well, people have written books about this, have spent their life uh, explaining this, so I'll keep it shorter and simple. Basically, a neural network is a universal approximation machine. It's the name of a theorem that says that if a network is large enough and if you give it enough data it's going to learn anything perfectly right that's it so it's a learning machine it's a learning machine you design it you show some data over and over and over again and it learns perfectly how to predict a given output from a set of given inputs okay it can predict absolutely anything and you know magically you don't have to understand exactly what happens in there which is nice but okay mathematically they're great they're great theoretically they're great for limited applications they were great but you know until very recently they didn't really work right they didn't really work and if some of you the older ones like me uh, were in the university let's say in the 90s and you studied probably you had you know a few hours on neural networks and AI I'm sure your teacher told you something like well yes okay artificial intelligence is really cool neural networks are really cool you can do all kinds of crazy stuff on paper but you know I, outside of the lab they're pretty much useless because we cannot solve bigger problems with those so it's all about scale 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 so that's it. That's the reason why they didn't work. That's the reason why in the 60s and the 70s and beyond, they just stayed in the lab and they were cool stuff to play with, but there were no industry applications, no real life applications of these because data was just not available. Okay, and remember I said you need lots of data to train and computing power was not available either, right? So tough luck, but it changed. Right? It, ch it changed for three reasons. The first one is data sets are everywhere, right? Digital data is literally everywhere, okay? Audio, text, uh, pictures, everything. Um, some public data sets are available on the internet, large ones. You can grab them, you can mine them. Uh, you can go on Kaggle, you can do com uh, machine learning competitions, deep learning competitions. So data is just everywhere. So everybody now can grab data and start training and start building apps. The second thing is computing power is, um, well, it's always a problem, isn't it? <laughs> it's less of a problem than it used to be, right? Because now we have GPUs, and in the mid-2000s and, and later on, uh, research teams found that actually GPUs could be used for something smarter than playing 3D games, right? So instead of using all that fantastic power to build 3D games and shoot each other, well, we could, you know, do some actual scientific work. And, you know, I guess that's a good thing. And so now GPUs are everywhere. Um, they're fairly cheap and, and they deliver massive amounts of computing power. And the third thing that helped uh, deep learning 
explode is um, the elasticity and the, scala the scalability provided by clouds. Okay, because it, just like everything else, um, why would you buy 50 fancy GPUs to train for you know, a couple of hours a week and have them do nothing the rest of the time when you can just go to the cloud and grab a few GPUs for a few hours, train your model, and pay for those few hours and release them. Right. So the elasticity, the pay-as-you-go, you know, er everything that you know uh, for, uh, for cloud uh, also applies there. Right. Compute, storage, etc. It's all there. Grab it, use it, release it, and pay exactly what you have to pay and nothing else. So deep learning exploded, right? But let's look at a, a concrete application. Um, every year, there's a competition called uh, IS, ILS <laughs> VRC uh, among you know, uh, research teams across the world. And what they do is they take that uh, Im ImageNet data set, which is a very large data set, um, a, a whole, uh, which is composed of um, um, images uh, with a single thing in them, so it's either animals or objects or plants, uh, no humans. And they have thousands of categories, and they have to predict the right category for each image, right? That's the game. So actually, they can predict five categories for each image, and if the correct category is in the top five, then it, it's considered a win, okay? And so they've done this for years and years and years, uh, here's an example. These are real images from the data set. Um, so who thinks these dogs are, so it's not the same dog, but are, are they uh, from the same breed? All right. Who thinks they're not the same breed? Do we, do we have any Eskimos or Norwegians in the room? All right. Norwegians are usually pretty good at this. <laughs> yeah. And who has no ID? Well, I, personally, I have no ID, and I think if you gave me 15 minutes, I would still have no ID. Right? Some, some things tells me, some things tell me it's the same. Some things tell me it's not the same. Right? So, for the record, it's not the same breed. Okay, but how would you know? Right? How would you know? Unless you're real, you're a real dog expert, and you could actually explain to me that oh, I see the difference here and here and here. Okay, and then I show you a different breed and you're not an expert of those dogs and you don't know, right? So that's that informal knowledge we need to fit into the computers. So they've been playing this game with dogs and plenty of other categories for years, and these are the results. So they started in 2010, and the blue line is, uh, the, blue line is the error rate, okay? So uh, it goes from 28 to 25 to 16 to 11, down to 3% last year, okay? Only 3% error. And the red bar is how deep, how many layers the neural network that uh, one was, okay? So in the first couple of years, it was just one layer, and then it went up, as you can see, 8 and 19 and 22, up to that crazy number of 269 layers, okay? So now the question is, what do you think this, the, the score would be for humans, right? Uh, uh, normal humans. If I gave you the ImageNet data set, all right, and, and lots of coffee, and as I asked you to score, well, it's, it's, it's millions of images, so it would take a while, but okay, theoretically, you could do it with lots of coffee. <laughs> what would be your average error? I have no idea. Well, I, I guess our brains have much more than 269 layers, okay? So, but still, our brain is different. So what would be the, what would be the score? Who says um, less than five or less than three? Who thinks humans would actually beat the machine? No one, okay. Who says more than 10%? Okay, and between five and 10? All right, okay, so, so the answer is actually five, <laughs> 5.1, if you want to be exact, okay? 
But again, it's theoretical because if I gave you maybe 50 images, you would do this. If I gave you a thousand images, maybe not so much. If I gave you a million images, you would never get to the end, right? So the computer can do it faster, longer, is never tired, and you know, it will give the same answer all the time. So what this means is actually uh, deep learning models and computers are now better at recognizing stuff than us, right? With the, uh, with, I would say, uh, given the condition that they actually have been trained on it, of course. If you show them something they've never seen, right, they won't know, and maybe we will, because we're smarter, right? But still, uh, it's an impressive number, and I'm sure it will keep going down. So this is just one example. There are many more applications of deep learning, and uh, we'll see a few more as we go. Um, but now let's try to talk about um, how, we, how you can actually, oh yeah, please, you have a question. What does it mean a layer? It means this. In the, top, uh, in the top right corner. So a layer is uh, a set of neurons that are connecting to the, connected to the previous layer and to the next layer, and, and they all work in parallel to do some computation, right? So at the minimum, you will have an input layer, okay, which will be your input data. So let's say my pixels, right? Uh, so let's go back to my million pixel example. So I would have one million uh, input neurons each of them with the input uh, with the pix with one pixel value, and the output layer would be probably um, uh, the number of categories I have. So let's say I have a thousand different categories. Okay, so I would have a thousand neurons in the output layer, and I would just want one to be activated for a given image, right? And in the middle, I've got uh, what we call hidden layers, which are just um, additional layer of neurons that do their magic, right? That just extract features, we'll see some examples, extract features from the input uh, layer and gradually uh, learn how to uh, act activate the correct output neuron for a given input, right? Um, so y there are different structures. Uh, in, in this example here is, is uh, what we call a fully connected uh, network. So each neuron is connected to all the inputs and all the outputs of the previous and next layer. Okay, um, but there are different architectures, right? And now you can you start to understand why it's so heavy from a computation point of view, right? Because it's you know it's n1 times n2 times n3 times, so it's, it's a lot of connections, and each of them has to be uh, optimized and computed. Yep, yeah, yeah, training is, we'll, see, we'll do some live training on, on a smaller data set, right? You'll see, uh, you'll see that. Okay, so now let's talk about um, what we do at Amazon. So. Actually, Amazon has been doing lots of AI for, I want to say forever. It's probably not quite true, but it feels right. Um, Amazon was started in 95 and as a bookshop, as you know. And if you go to the internet and look for screenshots of the early website, very early on you had uh, recommendation, right? And then you had per content personalization, etc. So very early on, um, you know, they, they felt they had to have that smart feeling to the website, right? That custom experience to the website. And then as time went by, um, Amazon started to use uh, AI for their, uh, for the, what we call the fulfillment centers. So where the, where the goods are actually stored and where they're shipped from. You may have seen uh, those videos on YouTube of the, the Amazon robots that pick up the shelves and, and move the shelves uh, to, uh, to the humans so that they can pick the objects and prepare your order, right? If you haven't seen this, you, you should take a look. <laughs> uh, just look for Amazon Robotics on, uh, on YouTube. And today we have more than 40,000 robots live uh, every single minute in all of our uh, fulfillment centers, just moving around and autonomously and moving stuff <laughs> so that you know, we can all get our orders in time. 
Um, of course, there's tons of AI and machine learning on the website. Uh, if all of us went to the same web page on Amazon, we would not see the same thing, for sure, right? We would see different products, different layouts, different everything, actually. And I'm sure you've seen this, um, although I, I don't think it's available in Italy, um, but uh, it's available in the UK and in, in Germany and in the US, so hopefully, s uh, and not in France, <laughs> hopefully soon. Um, so the Amazon Echo family of, uh, of devices, uh, the, the personal assistants, um, and you can just talk to them and order a taxi, order a pizza, ask for the news, ask for weather information. Uh, every single day we have new, uh, uh, new skills, as we call them, that come out for, uh, for the Echo devices. Um, and it's, uh, it's ev evidently all based on deep learning technology, natural language processing, uh, text-to-speech, etc. Right. So that's a consumer product. That's, I would say, the visible side of all the work that Amazon is doing on AI, right? But there's, of course, we're developers, so we want to build stuff. And there's a, uh, there's a full stack of uh, AI and machine learning solutions and services that are available in AWS, right? Starting from, of course, the infrastructure, the, the, C the instances, so obviously we have CPU instances, we have also GPU instances. I'll show you, uh, I'll show you one in a minute. We'll do some training. Um, on top of this, uh, we could run uh, your favorite deep learning libraries. So today I'm going to use MXNet, but you could use uh, TensorFlow or Keras or, or something else. Um, then if you want to actually go deeper and, and really do um, you know, build your custom algorithms and your custom applications. You could use um, our uh, EMR service, uh, which is the basically a managed service for the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, to do Spark and and uh, and all the other uh, Hadoop friends. Uh, you could do um, um, you could do Amazon machine learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have a full set of services that are, that'll you, that allow you to build smarter applications. But you need to be an expert, right? And uh, although we all have machine learning and, <laughs> and soon deep learning on our resumes, right? Not everyone is an expert, okay? So uh, we thought, and you know, our customers asked us to do that, that it might be interesting to build some higher level services, right? Which are just an API call away um, and, and very simple to use and yet able to do very complex things. And these are the three services that you see on top, uh, Lex, Poly, and Recognition. And I'm going to talk about those for a minute and then show them to you. Okay. So the first one is Poly. Uh, well, it's easiest to explain. Uh, Poly is text-to-speech, right? So it's just one API call, select a language, select a voice, and, uh, and you get the sound file in real time. Uh, with a human sounding voice. So today we have uh, four, uh, 24 languages, including Italian, so we can try that, and 48 different voices, okay? And we'll keep adding more. The next service is Lex. So Lex is a chatbot service, so you can design uh, a conversational interface using text or using, again, voice. And, and integrate that uh, in, uh, in the uh, AWS platform with uh, uh, your web app or your mobile app or, or on Facebook or you know, on external channels. Um, so pretty cool service if you're into chatbots. And the last one is recognition. So recognition is image recognition. So it can do object detection, and face detection, face comparison, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can imagine, all these are obviously based on deep learning. But all you have to do here is just call an API, right? So let's give it a try. Okay. So of course we could play in the console here, um, you know, recognition and poly. Oh yeah, we want to try the Italian. All right. Um, could could I have the mic for a second? <laughs> Okay, so that might be a little small. Okay, so here are all the voices that we support, right? 
And so for Italian, we have two voices. We have Carlo and Giorgio. Very Italian names, so let's try this. Hopefully I have some, yeah. Oh no, I don't. Um, well, it's coming, oh, it's on the HDMI. Uh, oh, oh, that's okay, we can do this. Okay, let's try that again. Ciao, mi chiamo Carla. Leggerò qualsiasi testo che digiterai qui. Okay, so that's Carla and let's have a Giorgio. Ciao, mi chiamo Giorgio. Leggerò qualsiasi testo che digiterai qui. Okay, and, and you can go totally stupid and if you want to do... Do you have anyone from Iceland in the room? No. <laughs> Too bad. Okay. All right, let's do Iceland. Ég heiti Dóra. Ég les upphátt allan texta sem þú skrifar hér. Okay. All right. Well, we could do this all day, but that's not the point. Thank you. Okay, so as you can see, this is really just um, this is just an API call. So I could do this. Uh, I could do this on my uh, on my laptop too. We'll, we'll do it on the robot afterwards. Okay, I can just show you. Yeah, he gives it. Yeah. Okay, so this is local here. Um, and let's. Okay, so that's Polly basically. I want to show you recognition now. So that's Polly, right? 24 voices. Um, the 24 languages, 48 voices, and. Um, and it's extremely fast, so you can either play the sound file and have an interactive thing going, or you can save it and use it in your applications. Um, so very, very easy to use. Uh, if you want to see what the API looks like, after all, let's do this. Well, this is it, really, right? That's all there is to it. You select a voice and, uh, and the, the format, which is MP3 here by default, and the text. Uh, that you want to uh, generate, and that's it. So one API call away, and you get, uh, in real time, a human-sounding voice, okay? And then either you play it or you, uh, uh, either you play it or you save it for, for further use. So that's all you need to do, one API call. You don't have to be a deep running expert to do this. Okay, let's take a look at recognition now. So let's take my favorite image. Should I show it to you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Okay, so it's Oktoberfest, but I'm sure we have a, a Rimini Fest and a Bologna Fest, and you know, we have the same thing all over the world, right? Okay, so that's my picture. It's a fairly complex picture. So now let's call recognition on that picture and see what happens. Oh, and I, oh, sorry. I need to copy that image to S3. On, or, so that's my bucket name. Or could we have the sound on the HDMI? No, maybe not. We don't have a tech. Yeah? No. Um, uh, option to add the sound or open. Oh, wow. So I need to go in my Mac settings? All right. to learn something now. So you can select sound, select the output, the uh, Yeah, it, it says HDMI, so. Uh, just the speaker, so can you just select the speaker itself? Hmm. Let's try this again. Uh, yeah, because it's not, it's not the same as before, so make sure that you just change. Oh, it. okay, see so what you mean. The other way. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. No, I, no, I'm, I'll be fine actually. <laughs> you can hear it, right? Or not? Do you want the mic? Yeah, let's have the mic. Thank you. Okay. So let's um, let's send that image to recognition and see what happens. Okay. So. Pretty immediately, I see some labels and confidence. 15 faces have been detected. Here are some key words about this picture. People, person, human, 
Alcohol, beverage, drink, crowd, female, girl. Okay. So I would say that's a fairly accurate description of that picture, right? Um, and so, like I said, we've got labels, we've got confidence scores, and then we find 15 faces, which is the maximum number we can find. It's, it's a predetermined limit, right? We stopped it at 15. And for each of them, we get some information like gender, age range, emotion detection, and there's additional information on um, uh, where, where the nose is and where the eyes are, etc. but I didn't print it out. So if I uh, show you my script, then, you know, uh, highlights the faces that has been found, that have been found, and as you can see, we see 15 faces, right? And we could check that, okay, face uh, two here, that lady here is, uh, where is she? Okay, here she is. Okay, she's female. She looks pretty happy. Well, she looks to be closer to 23 than 14, but okay. You know, pretty, uh, pretty safe. Oh, by the way, never do this with your girlfriend, okay? <laughs> never take a picture of your girlfriend and use this. Never, right? Or your wife, never, right? Or your, your mother might forgive you, but uh, your girlfriend will not. Okay, trust me. All right. Um, okay, let's try a different one just for a second. Okay, so I, I, I'm not showing you this picture for now. A single face has been detected. Here are some key words about this picture. City, downtown, metropolis, urban. Okay, and obviously that's Polly that you hear here. Uh, I'm extracting some outputs and sending them to Polly. Okay, so let's see how fast you can find the face, because there is a face in here. Ready? All right. <laughs> so it's a larger crowd, but we usually with a smaller group, you know, I have like a, you know, I ask people to raise their hand when they see the, the face. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for some people it takes a few seconds, right? So uh, because yeah, it's way over there and uh, it's, uh, it's hidden in this very complex picture. And it's interesting to see that the, uh, the, the uh, cartoon face is not picked up because it's not a face because no one has high eyes half the size of their uh, face, at least not where I come from. Or, or maybe after a very, very long evening <laughs> abusing substances, but in the general case, that's not a human face, right? Okay, so this is recognition, okay? Um, pretty cool. But and, and you will find uh, all, the, all the code and, uh, and everything. Again, it's on, it's on GitHub. Um, I can just show you the, uh, the Rico API. It's, uh, it's super easy as well. OK, so this is the one to detect faces, right? Uh, again, single API. Uh, you literally copy the image to S3 and, and point recognition to it. Comparing faces needs a source image and a destination image. Um, but as you can see, you know, it's, and detecting an image, again, is as easy as this, right? Where the image is, how many labels you want, and what's the minimum confidence score that you want to, uh, to report, okay? So pretty smart uh, services, but if you're, a, if you're a very bad Python developer like me, you can use them in minutes. Right, you don't have to be an expert. Okay, but there's a problem with this. Okay, and yeah, we have tons of customers. Oh, let's, let me mention a few. Uh, the, the Washington Post is using Poly in their mobile app to, uh, to read articles, right? So you, can, you don't have to look at your phone like this. You can just, you know, uh, click play and, and let, uh, let uh, the, the Washington app read the article to you, right? And you can actually focus on what's outside, which is nice. Um, and, you know, Capital One is one of the top 10 banks in the US, a very large bank. And they have a, a, a Lex application um, 
for people to use to have information on their banking details, right? So you can just, uh, instead of going to the bank website and looking at the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the detailed report that we never quite understand, you can just use a chatbot and say, okay, uh, how much did I spend on uh, restaurants last month? Right, that, that kind of thing. So that's very, very cool. So again, like I said, there is a problem with what I showed you, right? Uh, in, the, in I would say in the context of uh, you know devices and robots, etc. Uh, the problem is we need the cloud, right? We need the cloud connection. We need network connectivity. And sure, I could use recognition and uh, and uh, and everything on my uh, on my robot over there. So maybe it's time to bring the robot now. So, okay, here's my friend. So it's a, it's a Raspberry Pi robot. So, so sure, I can, uh, I can connect to that little guy. And I could use, uh, I could use Polly to do a Tons of silly things like this. Hello, friends. Thank you for visiting us today. I hope you'll have a great time. Now, Julian, could you please stop clowning around and get on with the talk? Right. Thank you. And thank you to, for, to Air France for not crushing the robot this time. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty regular event. I keep fixing it, but now it's okay. So, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's a Raspberry Pi. It has a Wi-Fi key. I can connect to the internet. I can use anything I want with this, okay? It's, it's a Linux system. But can we expect all the robots of the world and all the uh, devices of the world to be uh, always on, always connected to, to the cloud? Probably not, right? It's, it's an unsafe assumption. Autonomous cars and stuff, right? You go in the tunnel and then what happens? So um, we need something different, right? Something that could work and not be cloud-based. Um, and this is what I'm gonna talk about for, for the rest of the presentation. It's, uh, we can build deep learning applications um, using MXNet and embed them on devices like this, which are not powerful at all, right? This has a one gigahertz uh, clock speed and one gig of memory. So it's a very, very small device if you compare it to a typical computer or server, right? And, and we're going to do local AI on this little fellow here without any cloud connection. So a few words about MXNet first. So MXNet is for programmers, Right? It's, it's really, like I said, it's developer friendly. It supports multiple languages, uh, like, of course, Python, uh, C++, JavaScript, MATLAB, uh, and uh, Julia, and I'm sure I'm forgetting something here. Uh, it's an Apache project, so it's open. It's not controlled by any company. Um, AWS has committed to supporting this project because we think it's, uh, it's the most appropriate, and I will explain why in a minute. Um, both for uh, cloud-based application and, and for uh, smaller devices. Um, and in the, I think in the top 10 uh, MXNet committers, we have uh, four people, four or five people working for AWS right now. Um, it's high performance, um, you know, as will, you will see, even on a small device like this, it runs fairly fast uh, and it doesn't require gigabytes and gigabytes of memory, right? And uh, like I said, we endorsed it uh, because for all those reasons, and also because in, in a wider context, it scales very well, right? So why is scaling important? Scaling is not really important at this stage. Scaling is, impo is important when you train the model, right? So when you actually take those million of images or those terabytes of sound uh, bytes, etc., and you train the model. This is, this is where the operations are the heaviest. And so you want to be able to use as many GPUs as you can to speed up training, okay? 
and MXNet can do this very easily um, uh, in, in the code, and it can do it very efficiently uh, when it's running on, as you can see here, up to 16 GPUs with almost linear scaling, which means if you train on 16 GPUs, it's pretty much 16 times faster than when you train on one GPU, right? Almost perfect linearity. And it goes beyond this. If you, why 16? Because 16 is the largest GPU instance that we have, right? Uh, the largest instance that we have has 16 GPUs. So in one server, that's the limit. But we can have multiple instances, and uh, we could go up to 256 GPUs, so 16 instances with 16 GPUs in them. And again, as we scale on multiple training on multiple servers, we see almost linear scalability again. And that's something you will not see in other frameworks, right? Most other frameworks can either uh, not do GPU at all, or they can do maybe one GPU, or maybe, maybe if you tweak your code like a maniac, you can get it to run on multiple GPUs in the same machine, uh, and that's just one line of code when you do that in MXNet. And then training on multiple hosts, then it becomes, this becomes a real project if you want to do this with other libraries. For MXNet, it's almost as simple as sharing SSH keys across the nodes so, so that they can connect to one another, and that's about it, right? The data set will be split automatically and so on. It's, it's really nice. So that's one of the reasons also why we like, uh, why we like MXNet. It's because you know, scalability is very important for our customers, and, for, and thus it's very important for us. And we want to make sure we build services that scale to the max, right? So let's do some demos. So let's start with something simple. Um, let's do some training for a second. Um, so here I'm going to use a GPU instance to train an image recognition model on a data set, which is called MNIST. And I guess most of you or some of you have seen this before. MNIST, yeah, it, it's very popular. Uh, it's uh, 70,000 handwritten digits from 0 to 9. And of course, the goal is to show an image and get the, the, the proper result at the end, okay? Um, so let's do this. And you can see, where is my instance? <laughs> here it is, okay. So here I'm running on a, on a smaller GPU instance. It has only one GPU, but that's more than enough for what I need. And I'm running an Amazon machine image, which is called the Deep Learning AMI, which is uh, built by us, and you can use it for, uh, at, no, at no cost. And the cool thing with this is that it comes pre-installed with everything. So whatever framework you use, you know, uh, Cafe, MXNet, TensorFlow, blah, 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 anything else, it's already in there. So you can just boot up your GPU instance with this image, and everything is ready for you to work. You don't need to go and install the CUDA drivers and the NVIDIA stuff which is a little tricky to do, okay? And so here, um, whoops. Okay, I wrote, oh, MXNet, yeah, and this, all right. So I designed a very simple model, right? So it's, Okay, it's 30 lines of code, right? To do everything. So it's, like when I say it's developer friendly, it really is, it's very high level, right? So you don't have to go and, and uh, coming back to your questions earlier, you don't have to go into the details of, of every single neuron and just define layers, connect them, and that's it. Okay, and that's what I'm doing here. So um, I've got a series of blog articles on this with every single detail explained, so I'm gonna go a little faster here I want to get to the point. Um, basically here, um, you, uh, you just load the data set, right? So you load those images. Uh, there's a training set that we use for training, and there's a validation set that we use to evaluate the quality of the model, just like we do in machine learning, okay? This is the network definition, okay? So an, in an input layer. Uh, then um, a first hidden layer, fully connected. 
a second hidden uh, with uh, 128 neurons, a second fully connected layer with 64 neurons, and then the output layer with 10 neurons. And 10 is not a surprise. It's because we have uh, 10 categories, right, from 0 to 9. Okay, so we need to figure out what digit this is. And that's all it takes, right? That's all it takes to define my network. Okay, define the layers, def define how they're connected, define how many networks, how many neurons are in each layer, and that's it. So we have multiple types of networks, uh, but this is, um, this is the simplest one. And as you can see, it's only six or seven lines of code, okay? Then I bind my data to that model, okay? The data I loaded. I just say, okay, this is what you're gonna train on, and now you train, okay? Then I'm saving the results, so I'm saving all the weights for all the layers, right, because I wanna reuse it afterwards. And then I use my validation set to measure the accuracy of the, of the model, okay? So, not a lot of code, right? So let's do this. How do I train it? Just like this. So it's gonna load the data, and then it's gonna run for, I think it's 10 epochs. So an epoch is learning the full data set once. Okay, so here I'm taking that data set and I'm sending it 10 times into, into my model, okay? Batch by batch, but the full set goes 10 times in a row into the network. And I can see my, uh, I can see my training accuracy going up, right? And actually, if I, uh, if I let it run for a little more, let's give it maybe 30 epochs, you will see it gets to one, okay? That's that universal approximation theorem I mentioned. Okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna learn that data set perfectly. It's gonna learn the training set perfectly. But then, when I take the validation set and I run it, of course, I get a lower score because these are images that the network has never seen before, okay? So again, yeah, we'll get to one. <laughs> okay, so maybe I need 30, 32 or 35 epochs, right? Okay, so training accuracy almost gets to one, and then validation accuracy is 97%, okay? And then I could use, um, I could use some um, handmade digits that you can see here, so I did them myself, and I could try and run them through the network, right? So I'm gonna load each image, and, and, and load the model that I trained and just run it through there, okay? And do this and see what the scores are. Okay, so, uh, well, so you can see 10 probabilities, right? Because obviously we have 10 categories. So they're pretty close to one. They're not perfect, but they're pretty close to one. So the first image is a zero, and the second, and all these are pretty good. And well, the nine is not so great. The probability is lower, but we're still okay with the fact that it's a nine, okay? So I could have a better network, I could train for longer, I could improve everything, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But okay, that's a, that's a, s a very simple model here. Um, now I wanna do something more complex, right? I want to be able to do that ImageNet thing I mentioned earlier. I want to do it here, I want to use a pre-trained network, right? Training on ImageNet takes a while. I cannot do it here. Um, and I want to uh, take that model, say, uh, train it in the cloud using the cloud scalability, save it, and then copy it in there and use it locally, okay? And that's what I'm doing here. So let's go back to, let's go back to my robot here. So here's the model I'm talking about. It's the inception model. It's 44 megabytes, so it's not huge, but it's, it's, a, fairly, uh, it's a fairly advanced model, okay? It's been trained on ImageNet. 
And I'm going to do pretty much the same thing that, like you saw here. I'm going to load the model, and I'm going to ask the robot to recognize images. Right. But to make it a little more fun, actually, I'm going to have the robot take a picture of objects right, using the camera down there and recognizing that. OK? So it's all in Python. It's fairly easy to do. And we just have to start that server. And hopefully, it still works. OK, yeah. Uh, yeah, the loudspeaker is on. So can the thing move or not? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so just to make it a, li a little more even difficult to set up, okay, I've got this thing here. So it's an Arduino, which is Italian, right? <laughs> or something. So it's an Arduino uh, with a, uh, I guess it's the PlayStation joystick connected to it. And here, this has nothing to do for, to, with deep learning, but it's pretty funny, so why not? Uh, and uh, whoops. and I'm, it's an IoT thing, OK? So I'm using uh, the IoT service of AWS to, uh, through Wi-Fi here uh, to send messages back and forth to the cloud, so from, from here to the cloud, to the robot, et cetera, et cetera, OK? So I can drive that thing. Can you see it? Yeah. So I'm making sure it's not falling off. That's why it's stopping. OK, so let's, let's have an object somewhere. OK, I'll take my lucky object, the one that should work. And then if you want, we can try something else. Hmm. <laughs> OK, I need to cheat. It's not, yeah, OK. It's, yeah. yeah. You know, I keep saying it's, it's, it's a running, I mean, it's an old joke now, but sorry, I have to do it again. But some people think robots are going to kill us all, but you know, we're, we're quite safe. We're quite. This one is very friendly. Uh, it, it's got a Twitter page. You can follow him on Twitter. OK, uh, so I'm going to try something else that's probably not going to work either, but OK, fine. So have you seen this before? Uh, it's the IoT button. You just click it, and it sends an IoT message uh, to AWS IoT, and so this one, if it gets through, if not, I will fake it. Um, let's try it. We'll send a message to uh, to the robot asking it to take a picture. Oh yes, it is working, and telling it what it sees. I'm 98% sure that this is a baseball. All right. It's 31 centimeters away. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right, bring me your objects now. OK. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. OK. So I click here, sends an IoT message to AWS IoT in, in Dublin. The robot gets it. So it's back and forth to Ireland. As you can see, it's pretty fast. The robot takes a picture. The robot takes a picture with the camera and uses the local MXNet model to, uh, uh, to detect it. Oh. This button has been giving me trouble, so I should try something else. Oh, come on. OK, I can fake it. That's OK. No worries. Works only once. Just use violence. Yeah, see? That works. I'm 69% sure that this is a water bottle. The right. object is 51 centimeters away. OK, pretty good, right? So, so you know, it's all fun and everything. And of course, we're going to try those, and it's going to fail. Um, because this is a really small object. I don't, know. I don't know what the distance should be. Maybe here? Yeah. So once again, what happens is, OK, there's the IoT thing going on. Yeah. 
but and there's poly right the voice comes from polya as you can understand as you can imagine uh, so I really need to hit it right come on work <laughs> okay I'll, I'll take it I can send the I can send the message from here as well um, and so the, it takes the picture all right that's my complex protocol No, oh, uh, now it's quite dead, is it? Come on. Oh yeah, there it goes. I'm 13% sure that this is a pole. The object <laughs> is 22 centimeters away. What did you see? Oh yeah. Oh, lighter is in there. Hey, I get, I get five, remember? I get five categories, so I won. Um, so, now this, this is not gonna work at all. Uh, I, I'm quite sure because it has a picture and it's, got, you know, it's, it, if you show it a picture of something, it, you know, it gets it wrong. So if you have some other objects, uh, do you have a laptop or something? Laptops usually work. We can try that and then conclude before they kick me off the stage. <laughs> I want to try. Yeah, I don't. I don't have much in here. Oh. Okay, we can try this. All right, last one, right? This is giving me a headache. So oh man. Like yeah. Okay. Fine. Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> no, that's never gonna work. <laughs> very dependent on my phone here and it's not working great. Yeah, here we go. I'm 67% sure that this is a thimble. The object is 20. What? Okay, pill bottle, man, it's in there. Come on. Hey, I still win. <laughs> All right, they're going to kick me off the stage. <laughs> All right, so Julian one, Rimini zero. Okay. All right, so oh no, I don't need this. Thanks. Um, so I'm getting to the end. I mentioned the deep learning uh, AMI already. Uh, again, I went very fast because there's so much stuff I wanted to show you today. Uh, you know, keep you uh, hopefully interested. Um, you will find all this stuff in detail on my, uh, on my Medium uh, blog. Uh, so just go to medium.com, uh, 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 Jewel Simon. Well, it's easy to find. And, and you will find uh, all the tutorials to get started with MXNet, uh, to do training, etc. how to do the Raspberry Pi thing, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, so it's all, it's all out there. All right, there are plenty more resources. There's one I want to mention. I recorded an AWS podcast um, a, a couple of weeks ago with an introduction to MXNet. So just look for AWS podcasts, MXNet. There's only one, and it's mine. So uh, you can listen to that and, um, and get some additional information. Okay? So I want to say grazie mille. Uh, thank you. Danke schön. Merci. Uh, gracias. And that I'll stop there. You know, I, I cannot do the 24 voices. Thank you very much, uh, EuroPython, for having me. Thanks for listening, and if you have questions, I'm here.